Good day. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for the Preventive Medicine Center and West Hartford Cable Access TV. A couple of things about today's program. First of all, uh, you can't tell at this point, but I'm sitting. Now, most of us spend most of our life sitting. There are very few people outside running around. Well, you might say policemen and firemen and so on and so on. But uh, what we think of most of America is now sitting. In addition, this is a picture of my cane. Now that's interesting too because uh, we're going to get to a discussion about stem cells. Ultimately, today's discussion is going to be about public speaking and women. So I have this friend, his name is Greg Fortin, and he's a guitar expert of all things and I happen to own a very interesting guitar, and uh, not uncommon, uh, a Les Paul uh, guitar. And so he likes to see that and has looked at it and is interested in it. But he has coached me, and I'd like to do more public speaking. So first of all, if any of you want me to do public speaking, you get yours truly. All you have to do is call. Uh, he wants me to be a motivational and inspirational speaker. And, uh, you know, I use these little cues. Uh, I'm not the most completely mentally gifted. I have my own particular style. But uh, I'd like to hear from you what you think about the way I do on these programs and this program in particular. Now, um, today we're going to talk about people, not facts. Every time I talk to him, he gets on my case about, well, heart disease is the most common whatever, and uh, people, women in particular, think breast cancer is the major scary whatever, and I've got to admit it is pretty scary to me. But uh, it turns out heart disease, and he says, no, wait a minute. Why don't you tell a story about a person? So um, I did on the phone. He and I just talked the other day. So we talked about two stories about women that had occurred to me this past week. Uh, I have many stories that I could tell. Every patient is a story, to be perfectly honest. But these two kind of stuck out in my conversation and quickly came up. Uh, the first one is a little bit about creativity. A young woman who does house cleaning uh, as a business, and uh, I've had her on this diet and that diet, and they're all pretty much the same. Very high fiber, very low fat, um, uh, ideally organic, unprocessed foods, foods, I use the phrase, foods exactly as they grow up out of the ground and in the field. So that would mean like brown rice, not brown rice pasta. Anyhow, she's on this diet that is oriented that direction, but she's doing the OMAD diet, O-M-A-D. Ever heard of that? I had never heard of that until this past week. The OMAD diet is one meal a day, which brings up the interesting concept of fasting. Fasting is really important as long as it's not carried to an extreme. The human body ought to be given a break. When I recommend a supplement, I recommend a supplement five days a week in order to give the body a break. We're supposed to go to sleep in order to give the body a break. So she had trouble sleeping. She had trouble with her menstrual period. She had trouble with all kinds of things. Now, it turns out she also went out to California, visited a family member, met a guy out there. And I just wonder how all that figured into her vast improvement which she attributed mostly to her OMAD diet, one meal a day. Now, not a lot of people seem to be able to do that. Most of us sort of eat obsessively or compulsively, continuously. But if you could eat a little bit, eat whatever food you're going to eat in one meal a day, and give the body a break until the next day, I think that'd be a great idea as long as it wasn't too late in the day. In other words, don't tell me you're going to have your big meal at uh, 8.30 and then you're going to bed at 10.30. Uh, that's not the right idea. So uh, that's what she had done, and she had sort of stayed in the direction that I usually recommend, which is ideally organic, unprocessed, whole foods, exactly as they grow up out of the ground, which translates as grains, quinoa, bar hulled barley, oat groats, millet, buckwheat, uh, brown rice, uh, teff, amaranth, grains, vegetables. Now, if you're not really physically active, you can eat all the vegetables except, guess what? Potatoes. All right. Um, so 
grains, vegetables, beans, that's the ideal protein, fruit, nuts, and seeds. And I just learned a little something about that. After you get down to your nearly trim weight, if you increase your protein intake, it turns out to reduce central body fat, meaning how to get to clear lines of definition and demarcation, which she had. She was muscular, and she has an interesting trait that a lot of people do who exercise a great deal. Remember what her job is. She's working all day long. She had exceptionally smooth skin. It, 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 people have smooth skin. The people who exercise a great deal, and it even carries over into the future, meaning if you stop exercising, you get to keep that skin. People who exercise a great deal have this silky soft, and I don't mean there's a layer of fat underneath it, I mean it's a property of their skin. She had silky soft skin. Well, um, I, that really kind of changed my thinking, and I've started talking about it, as you can tell. Uh, she was happy. She was the happiest I'd ever seen. Like I said, she was planning to move to California. I warned her about California. And you may say, what do you mean warning people about California? California is a beautiful mess. And uh, the taxes are sky high. They have a homeless circumstance. They have more homeless people proportionally than any other state in the nation. Um, they have, uh, if there is an immigrant problem, we certainly all know about Kate Steinle, uh, they have a court system that leans very far liberal left, which is usually not a problem, but can be, and so on and so on. So anyhow, there are upsides and downsides. It's sort of a Garden of Eden with a mess thrown in. Anyhow, uh, that's where she's planning to move, uh, that's where her new boyfriend is, and uh, bless her, and so on. Now. What about the other patient? Now, let's see. I have to look at my little notes here. Uh, okay. Here's a statement I want to talk to you about. WIFM. I never heard of that before Greg. Greg taught me about WIFM. What's in it for me? Well, I hope I'm giving you some information that makes it be of value to you. And... Um, I hope this is, a, he wants me to be a motivational speaker, a motivational and inspirational speaker. Okay, how am I doing? Let me know. I like to say Lemmy, L-E-M-M-E, -M -M -E, let me know. Or Gimme, G-I-M-M-E. I know, bad English. I was an English major. Did any of you know that before I became a cardiologist? All right, so... Um, the second patient was a brand new patient that I'd never seen before, and this discussion is about racism. Lovely, lovely, friendly woman who had just come up from the Carolina. I can't remember whether it was North or South, but it was one of the Carolina, and she came up with her son. Well, what actually caught my attention in the beginning was how thoughtful and kind her son was. And he was so yes sir, no sir, and polite and this and that, and um, I asked him if he was born in the South. See, I spent two years in Atlanta, and believe me, the people in the South are different from the people in the North. People in the South are much friendlier. Uh, they go out of their way to be friendly. Just watch the commentators and the people who speak. They're all so polite and uh, in a friendly fashion, very formal. Uh, anyhow, so she was um, there and I was she had diabetes, she had high blood pressure, she was overweight, and she was brand new to me. So now, what was it I was going to start to do with her? The problem with me in my relationship with new patients is I try to be economical. And that's not always the smartest thing to do because I introduce a college degree's worth of information in the first visit when maybe I ought to put in just a little bit of this and just a little bit of that instead of giving them uh, the full court press of uh, brown rice, vegetables, beans, fruit, nuts, and seeds, water and weak herbal tea, exercise until you have clear lines of definition on your abdomen and uh, don't have unrealistic expectations. That's an awful lot of information to grasp when you're just getting to know me. And so, fortunately or unfortunately, that's what I've been doing for the entire time I've been in practice and to a point it has been very successful. So uh, anyhow, I did it, and uh, she said, well, this is what I have to do. So 
um, the, then there was this discussion about a statement about what people have to do. And this is where the racism came in. The statement was made, all I have to do is stay black and die. And I said, that's a very, uh, not as an accusation, but as an explanation. The fact that a person has to stay black, that means they can't be something else. That's a very racist, but it's a kind of a joke that black people understand. And they say it themselves. That's where I'd heard it. So the point being is that there are these little subtle racist things that people say and joke about. Uh, there wasn't any irritation when that was said. It was just a, a, a point of interesting discussion. So uh, anyhow, she made that she was going to make some changes. She stated she was going to make some changes. And uh, I hope uh, that she does and will. And I suspect she will. So that was the story of two people that I met last week that had sort of a profound effect on me and at the same time hoping to have a profound, more the that case in the first one and hoping I had a profound effect more that case in the second one. All right, enough of that. It wouldn't be me if I did not give the news of the day. It's hard for me to um, give a speech and not say, look, this is really important stuff. Uh, I want my audience to be aware of it. And then I'll talk about whatever the topic of the day is. So here is um, uh, some papers. This is one I just read this past week. This is the New England Journal of Medicine. I've praised this journal many times. It's not always correct, but here it has balancing safety and innovation for cell-based regenerative medicine. And what that talks about is basically using stem cells. At least I think that's what this article is about. Let me check it out quickly. Uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it is in part about stem cells. So um, I had stem cells. That's why I'm talking about it. And you might have stem cells. Stem cells are being injected into shoulders, into knees, and I had it in the hip. I flew back to my alma mater, Emory University, where I did my cardiology. And there was a wonderful physician down there by the name of Ken Mautner. And Ken was very professional. He did a kind of liposuction on me. I didn't like it. Uh, he's shoving that catheter back and forth in my abdomen to collect the stem cells. And then they have to spin down the fluid that they get and they take out the stem cells and then they injected it. Well, after the stem cells were injected, the, the question is, are those little robots going to go in there and clean things up and get rid of that arthritis that's in my hip from that ski injury and surgery in 1991? Well, that's so much news of the day. Now, usually I talk about, uh, I wanted to play um, uh, a video. I'm not sure I can do it, but let me see if I can do it. You got to get in. Oh my goodness, this is giving me a hard time. A little patience here. Stanley Holloway from sings with a little bit of luck. With a little bit of luck was recorded by Stanley Holloway. No. Nope. Stanley Holloway sings a little bit of luck on YouTube. With a little bit of luck was recorded by Stanley Holloway. Oh, here it is. So he could do his job and never shirk. The Lord above gave man an arm of iron, but with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, someone else will do the blinking work. Now that's an interesting idea. With a little bit of luck. What is it that determines our success in life? And basically, it involves doing things the right way. Who knows what is the right way? Clearly, we have two political parties that are looking at things completely oppositely. And so which one is right, or is it in between, or is it so much percentage of this one and so much percentage of that one? And uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, I think I've told this story before about a man uh, 
when I was an intern. He came into the hospital. He was the nicest person I'd ever met in my whole life up to that point. Uh, it turns out he was military. I think he was an officer. And he came into Ohio State where I did my internship and residency, Ohio State University Hospitals. Uh, and uh, he had acute leukemia. He never left the hospital and he was dead in six weeks. Now this is a fellow who had done everything right and it turned out wrong. Well, uh, that's sort of statistics and we have to look at those statistics. Most of us get away with doing a number of things wrong and yes, we end up with this hip surgery or that uh, angioplasty. Uh, last night I went to a dinner with, a, I, I didn't went to dinner. I went to dinner and sitting beside me was this very intelligent, nice guy uh, and uh, he'd had six bypasses. He's younger than I am. I won a dollar, by the way. Uh, I, he said uh, he thought he was older than I was. And I said, I bet you a dollar I'm older. And so when I told him my birthday, he had to end up giving me a dollar. So the meal uh, in Avon at Max's restaurant uh, cost me a dollar less. Anyhow, a uh, very nice guy, but he'd had six bypasses and obviously survived well uh, since then. I didn't get into too much detail like what's your non-HDL cholesterol, but there he was having done many things right, but a few things wrong, but had survived the wrongs. What are the right things to do? Now, we're talking about psychology primarily in this section. And most psychology has to do with understanding what you should be doing as opposed to what you should not be doing. What you should not be doing pulls you down. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about schools. I heard a staggering statistic. 63% of students in Massachusetts, I, I don't know what the figures are here in Connecticut, 63% of students in Massachusetts read at grade level. I was astounded. Only 63% can read at grade level? I take care of teachers uh, in Hartford. I don't think I have any... Uh, no, I, I have a teacher from Simsbury, and I don't know if I have any teachers from West Hartford. But um, uh, the, the, the teachers from Hartford describe it almost as a kind of a political prison or a prison for political disbelievers. Uh, they, they say that the students threaten the teachers, say unbelievably nasty things. I'm not saying all the students. I'm not saying all the teachers. I'm not saying all of Hartford. I'm not trying to make a point here that Hartford, uh, I'm trying to make a point about what do we achieve and where do we achieve it. And so the point being is students should be there to study and to learn and prepare themselves for what are the next steps. So we are supposed to breathe correctly, drink correctly, eat correctly, exercise correctly, and then the last one is unrealistic expectations. That is the psychological discussion. Don't think you're going to be a success in life by breaking all the rules. You could end up with open heart surgery or hip surgery, or you could not get ahead because you're not prepared for a proper job. Uh, I do wonder about these people, what they're thinking when they decide to take these really uh, strange majors uh, or even majors that may be too difficult to get ahead in. Uh, modern dance, uh, if there is such a major, I'm not saying there is. But uh, unrealistic expectations will end up holding you back more than you can imagine. And you always have to be thinking ahead. Not so much politically correct, but at least in a certain sense, that which is correct. Remembering that any time you get angry, you've wasted your time. There is no time in life for anything but good thoughts. And that may sound crazy to you, but hear me out. In life, here's, here's the saying, in life there's only room for good, for good thoughts and everything else is strictly business. In business, you make up your mind what you're going to do, you do it, and you accept the consequences. And you accept the consequences is about realistic 
expectations or unrealistic expectations. If you do things, if you go to demonstrate, if you act nasty, if you cut off people from speaking, if you're mean and rude, that's going to have an implication in terms of what your ultimate success is going to be. Things mean something, they spell themselves out down the road. So what did I mean? Let's go back briefly and talk about breathing correctly, drinking correctly, eating correctly. Bre breathing correctly means try not to live near an interstate, and if you do, get yourself an air filter of some kind to clean up the air. Uh, drinking correctly means essentially water and weak herb tea. Now, I like Coca-Cola, so I would say, well, it's not never have a Coca-Cola, but or never have a glass of wine. The thing that I say about wine is four glasses a week or less. And of course, that would be comparable for beers, four beers, or four shots of whiskey a week or less. I am not encouraging alcohol. I'm saying that is a max safe limit that will spell itself out down the road in terms of some kind of harm when you exceed what are the reasonable limits. And I'd like somebody to say, who, who are you to tell me what the proper limits are? Well, that's the whole point of this discussion. In trying to be personal and inspirational to you about this concept of unrealistic expectations, I've been sifting through the medical literature for boku years. Uh, I almost don't want to mention, mention it because you'll think I'm over the hill. Am I? Hmm. I got to think about that. No, I don't want to think about that one. I want to keep doing the thing that I'm doing. So breathing is clean air. Drinking is water and weak herb tea with not more than four beers a week. And everybody jumps up and says, well, what about coffee? Well, I think coffee is dirty water. But on the other hand, I'm not going to argue with the people so that they end up with a headache by stopping drinking their coffee, although you could switch to two bags of English breakfast tea equals one cup of coffee. You, one cup of coffee, maybe one and a half cups of coffee, but there are people drinking five and ten cups of coffee a day. And I am perfectly aware of the literature that says that kind of coffee intake is preventative for certain conditions, but to me it is provocative of other conditions. Things are always in balance. I remember when Bill Spear, uh, who was my teacher and a major teacher of me in nutrition, uh, talked, uh, taught me the word balance. And that is, you have to be careful not to do too much or too little of whatever you're talking about. So breathing, drinking, eating. Now, what is it we're supposed to eat? Do we have fangs and claws? Can we digest rotten meat? I didn't ask you whether or not you like hamburgers or pizza. I said, do we have fangs and claws and can we digest rotten meat? And do we have sharp teeth all the way to the back? And the answer is, we cannot digest rotten meat. We do not have fangs and claws. And we do not have sharp teeth all the way back to, as the hamburger eaters the meat eaters, the steak eaters, the fish eaters, the egg eaters do. We have flat grinding teeth like horses and, gout, uh, horses and goats and cows and chimpanzees and gorillas and other herbivore vegetarians. Now, I sometimes quote Shakespeare. And remember, we're talking about unrealistic expectations. Shakespeare the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the dew from the heavens. That's a discussion of gentility. And that's what needs to go on. I'm not saying to be weak in this and that. I'm saying you have to do things with a kind of a light hand, which is not exactly my style, or is it? Anyhow, being clear, going on about unrealistic expectations and the psychology. Things play themselves out in the future, and you will pay for the mistakes that you have made. It's sort of like you don't get any credit, you just get success if you do things right. But for everything you do wrong, it reduces your ability to achieve the goals that you wish to achieve, unrealistic expectations. You chose it, accept your choices, experience the consequences, learn from it and change, or don't. Now, breathing, drinking, eating. We live in an essentially vegetarian, vegan type body. So I think the balance, balance is probably 
90% unprocessed whole foods vegan and 10% animal protein. Once again, who the heck am I to tell you about what you should be eating or whatever? I'm telling you the benefits of what I think I have figured out and you are free to choose. Right here is where I'd like to play Freedom uh, by Richie Havens. Uh, uh, he played that at concert and was phenomenal. I saw him play that in New York City after he'd uh, gotten some teeth. He didn't have teeth when he sang that at Woodstock. But the Woodstock is a fabulous performance. So, um, breathe, drink, eat, exercise. You want to exercise to the point where you have essentially no, fat, no visible fat on your body. Well, I think that's pretty much it. Unrealistic expectations do that. That's how you avoid open heart surgery, like this fellow I met last night. And that's how to avoid simul the simultaneous prevention of multiple diseases. Hope this has proved of interest to you. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for the Preventive Medicine Center. And uh, let me know what you think. Am I going to be a great speaker or not?